Throughout this lecture series, bear in mind that we're going to answer how sociologists go about setting up research projects, how they ensure that the results of their research are reliable and accurate, and whether or not they can carry out their research without violating the rights of those they study. Now let's take a look at major research designs. Now you'll recall from your science classes that a research design is a detailed plan or method for obtaining data scientifically. For a sociologist, there are four designs that we rely on primarily, and those are surveys, observation, experiments, and existing sources. There are others that we use, but these four are the primary sources. Let's take a look first at surveys. This is the big hitter for sociologists. This is the one that we use the most. And there are generally two ways in which we conduct surveys, and one is the interview, either over the phone or face-to-face, -face, and then the questionnaire. And the questionnaire is usually in a printed form. Now, each technique that a sociologist uses does have benefits and limitations, and we're going to talk about a few of those here. Some of the good things about surveys is that they're usually inexpensive and they're simple to administer, and they do have a very quick turnaround. A survey is very helpful in finding out basic information from a large group of people in a very short period of time. Most of the time the results of a survey are anonymous, and respondents are generally willing to answer questions on sensitive topics such as income, sexual behavior, and the use of drugs. Even if we're in a face-to-face -face setting, we rarely know the research subject's name or any other kind of identifying information, and so it is a confidential, anonymous process. Face-to-face -face interviews have an extremely high response rate, up to about 99%, and it's theorized that because that type of situation involves personal contact with the researcher. Now it's important for the researcher to be able to develop a good rapport with the research subjects. So if, for example, uh, the researcher walks in with an attitude or with a chip on her shoulder or presents herself in a way that is not flattering to the research subjects and a rapport cannot be developed, that can seriously undermine the credibility of the research and the answers that uh, the respondents give. If we have the time to do in-depth interviews, or if that's what's called for in our research, we can get a lot of detail about the social world and very, very good descriptions of people's personal experience. One of the interesting things about face-to-face -face interviews is that oftentimes the researcher is collecting other data that the research subject is not even aware of. So while we're asking a question, and we're recording the answer to the question. We're also looking at body language, facial expressions, intonations, and all of that stuff can be very useful in interpreting the person's verbal response. Um, if a respondent doesn't understand a question, we can clarify by looking at their, their facial expression. We can maybe say the question in a different way. Being a good interviewer is definitely a skill that has to be honed. It's not something that you learn overnight. And an observant interviewer can gather lots of information on variables. Uh, you know, you maybe have to go into the respondent's home so you can get a wealth of socioeconomic data that way just by looking around and being observant. Some of the limitations of surveys, particularly those that are mailed questionnaires, are that they have a very low response rate. People don't tend to answer things via mail any longer. They're a little suspicious of who's asking for the information and why they want it. Uh, our response rate, in fact, for mailed surveys is at about 10%. Um, if the questions aren't clear or complicated, if you've written them in a potentially offensive way, respondents can simply throw it away and not even think about it again. We also know, interestingly, from gathering data, that people will offer opinions uh, about things that they don't know about. For example, we have done some surveys where we've made up political figures and fictitious legislation and mailed it out and asked questions about it, and respondents have responded to the questions and to the fictitious politician as if they actually exist and that these respondents know something about the issue. Something that also happens with surveys is that people may skip or lie about the questions that they feel are too nosy. For example, in the census of 2000, 53% of people who got the long form, which is not something that everybody gets, 
uh, didn't answer the questions about income. And this is standard with survey type questions. Income is considered a sensitive topic. Interestingly, the richer you are, the less liable you are to answer truthfully. The poorer you are, the more likely you are to answer truthfully. So face-to-face -face interviewing can be pretty expensive, but questionnaires and telephone surveys can be cheap. So there are benefits and drawbacks to both. One of the upcoming techniques for surveys is internet, and there are some inherent problems with using the internet, and that is that not everybody has access to the internet in their home. Not everybody understands how to use a computer. So there are significant demographic issues with who we're capturing data from and whether or not that's a good random sample of our population. So surveys capture either quantitative or qualitative data. If they're capturing quantitative data, it's uh, reporting primarily data that's in its numerical form. This is where oftentimes you'll hear information such as 99% of face-to-face -face interviews have high response rates and less than 10% of the people who are mailed questionnaires respond to them. They also capture qualitative data. The qualitative data that is captured is usually what happens in the field. So it's not necessarily about the question that you may be asking the person, but it's what's going on in that particular setting that becomes qualitative. So let's say, for example, you're doing a focus group on couples, and you have four or five couples there that you're asking questions to. And as a researcher, you can see that one couple is very loving towards each other. They're holding hands, and they're smiling, and they're making a lot of eye contact and one couple is sitting as though they're divided. They're not touching each other, and they both have their arms crossed across their chest, and they're not looking at each other at all. You can make some inferences about that, particularly if you're asking questions about, say, for example, satisfaction within the relationship, or uh, whether or not your spouse may have been cheating on you. So watching what's going on while you're asking the questions in a qualitative research project is essential. The second kind of method that we use is observation. And this is collecting information through direct participation or by watching a group or community. And this can be done covertly or overtly. We mostly do what we call participant observation, which is where we join a group to get a sense of how it operates. And we do have some sociologists who specialize in ethnography. Ethnographies take a very long period of time to complete, and they talk about an entire social setting. And so ethnographies uh, are more similar to anthropology or cultural anthropology than are the other forms of social research. It's interesting, we have some very fascinating participant observation studies out there, and there's a debate over the value of covert versus overt participant observation research. You know, if, if you're covert, then basically you're going in and infiltrating a group, you're behaving as if you're one of them, and you're taking your notes on the sly, and no one knows that you're a researcher. And while you can get some really, really good information, this can be dangerous. There are some situations in social science research where researchers have been put in harm's way because they've been outed at a point during their research, and the group that they were with really didn't take too kindly to that. Conversely, with overt observation, the group knows that you're researching them. It can change the way they behave. Ethnographies are a little bit less um, dangerous than that. And in an ethnography, you generally do spend enough time with the group that uh, they get to where they'll let their guard down with you. And it, by a lot of time, I'm talking some ethnographies take a few years of observation before you're even ready to start trying to compile and gather the information together to publish it. OK, the next kind of method that we're going to talk about is the experiment. Now, this is an artificially created situation that allows the researcher to manipulate variables. And we almost always have here an experimental group and a control group. Now, experiments are of limited value to sociologists. 
They're interesting, yes. Some experiments in the recent past, as far as sociology is concerned, are fascinating. We can look at the Zimbardo prison experiment. We can look at the Milgram shock experiment. We can look at the Ash experiment on conformity. They have a kind of voyeuristic interest when we watch the films about them. The problem with experiments for sociologists is that they don't replicate the real natural setting of the social world. And so they're of limited value when we want to make generalizations to the population. Yes, we can make some statements about what's happened in the lab when we applied the stimulus, but it's, it's a far way to assert that that's the way that people would also behave in the general population. So we, you know, while experiments can, can prove to be beneficial, we have to be careful with the assertions we make with regard to how far we can take those. And with experiments, we have to be very guarded against the Hawthorne effect. This is the unintended influence of observers or experiments on the subjects. This is when a subject knows they're being watched and their behavior change, be, changes because of it. This comes from a famous experiment that was done at the Hawthorne Electric plant. Uh, several researchers came in and said, we're here to observe your productivity for the next several days. And no matter what stimulus was applied to the workers in the plant, productivity increased. And what we really found there was because the subjects knew they were being researched and wanted to please the researchers, their productivity increased. So it's something that we have to bear in mind. Use of existing resources is also a good way to do sociological research. And there are a couple of different things we do here. One of the techniques we use is called secondary analysis. And this makes use of previously collected and publicly accessible information and data. For example, I may want to find something out about the southern region of states in America. And so I could rely on census data to find that out. The information's already been collected. All I have to do is go in and find the variables and ask the question, basically. Problematic with secondary analysis is that I don't have contact with the research subjects. And so if there's a question that I might need to follow up with, or if I'm not exactly sure about somebody's response, I don't have contact with that person. And so it is of value for some types of research, but if you have to get into depth with your research questions, then you might run into some problems with secondary analysis. But we do now have, in the United States, many very, very good longitudinal studies that have been publicly funded where the data banks are right online and available for anybody to go in and use. The other technique we use here with existing sources is what we call a content analysis. And a content analysis is where we might, for example, take some literature and code the words that are in that literature to see how many times they come up and then make some assertions about that. Or we might, for example, take pictures. There was a famous content analysis done several years back now of children's books. And when these researchers went in and coded the pictures and the language in children's books, what they found was the, the characters that represented males, whether they were in little boy form or animal form, tended to have more authority in these books than the characters that portrayed little girls or girl animals. Uh, they tended to be more passive. And so a statement could be made then about the positions or the roles of men and women in society, or little boys and little girls in society. Technology really has extended our range and capability to conduct research, and the software packages that we have now enable us to store and analyze much larger amounts of information than we ever were able to do in the past. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.